Hello, my name is Kevin Gebke. On behalf of CME Outfitters, I'd like to welcome and thank you for joining us for episode two of a four-part CMEO cast series, Informed Treatment Decisions for Pain Management, Changing Habits, Improving Outcomes. Today's episode is titled Patient Education to Manage Expectations About Pain and Pain Management. Again, I'm Kevin Gepke. I chair the Department of Family Medicine at IU um, School of Medicine in Indianapolis. Today, I'm joined um, by Hassan Mir, Professor and Director of the Orthopedic Residency Program at the University of South Florida and Director of Trauma Research at Florida Orthopedic Institute in Tampa, Florida. Welcome, Dr. Mir. Thanks for having me. Our first learning objective today is to educate patients about their pain and non-opioid pain management to optimize safe and effective multimodal treatment plans. Second, we'll assess patients for risk of misuse and diversion of opioids using a validated tool. So first, I think it's important for us to start a discussion about um, education, and, and I think it's it's well established at this point that it's not just about patient education. It's about educating um, everyone involved of the, the dangers of opioids, the risks associated with them, and other um, potential um, pain management tactics, and also having a, a better understanding of what our goals are when we're treating patients. So um, as, we, as we look to... Um, our patients and, and how we can engage them and, and work through. Um, what, what's been recommended is a, a, bio social, a biopsychosocial approach. Ultimately, um, we're going to do the, the, the same things that we do in most patient rooms as we're going through a, a, a history, a physical examination, um, any diagnostic screening and, and using tools um, that are available through your state to um, look for signs of previous um, use or misuse of controlled substances, doing that risk assessment and doing it in a way that um, the patient is engaged in the discussion and really has a lot of input into their treatment plan. And then that output really is us determining is someone at low risk, medium, or high risk um, for use of opioids or other types of um, treatments in that treatment plan, and really then individualizing that care. Ultimately, when we have a vast toolbox of potential treatments, we're going to um, have a different treatment plan for almost every patient, depending on what resources they have available, if they can use physical therapy, if they have access to a gym, if they um, are willing and, and able to do some of the non-medication, um, non-pharmacologic treatments, um, we can engage them in a, in a number of different treatment programs. Um, Dr. Mir, as you have these conversations with patients in your practice, um, how do you engage your staff and, and how do you involve the patient in, in this treatment um, plan and decision? So thanks, Kevin. So I think that you, know, you covered a, a lot of ground there and you mentioned early on about educating patients but also educating other stakeholders. So I think that the first uh, part of that is that um, with all of the negative press and the awareness of, of the opioid crisis in the U.S., the public is well aware now, uh, all healthcare uh, providers are aware now, and a lot of uh, policymakers are aware now of the severity of the problem. But then the next step comes into, well, if we're not supposed to use opioid monotherapy, what else can we use and how effective is it? And that's where we have a role now in, in taking the next step in educating uh, our patients and all of the other stakeholders. So when it comes to educating patients, there are various scenarios that as an orthopedic surgeon we run into. Um, 
the probably more common scenarios are the ones where you have elective uh, patients, meaning that you're seeing them in your regular office setting and develop rapport, develop a relationship and talk to them about these various uh, ways to manage pain and manage expectations. For example, seeing somebody with an arthritic knee or a painful shoulder or low back pain, that, and you see them over time and talk to them about uh, different uh, medication mo uh, medications they can utilize as well as other modalities, that's you know a long-term way to develop that. And certainly being part of the healthcare team with their primary care doc, and other healthcare providers uh, goes a long way. My particular setting is a little different and we're talking more about acute musculoskeletal injuries. You don't necessarily have the time to build rapport with people who are acutely injured, especially in a trauma center, which is where I do the vast majority of my work. If somebody comes in after a motorcycle accident and has a broken femur, they just want relief right away. And so it's a little, more challenging to have the discussion, but we still have them with the background now that I think almost everyone is aware of the opioid crisis. So it makes having that discussion a little easier to recommend and remind them that we want to control their pain responsibly, but that we want to use other types of medications and other modalities to do so. So we mentioned to them right off the bat that we're going to use uh, NSAIDs, that we're going to use uh, acetaminophen, that we're uh, you're going to use gabapentin, that we're going to use ice and elevation, that uh, we recommend, you know, in a lot of centers now, they're using aromatherapy, even in the hospital. Uh, we're using cognitive behavioral therapy with, uh, with music and relaxation and guided meditation. So kind of strange stuff to hear from an orthopedic trauma surgeon, but all these things are evidence-based and work. And so we start to talk to our patients uh, about this during their hospitalization and that they can use these things after discharge as well. It, it's, it's nice to have that conversation on the front side. It, it certainly, as that transition of care occurs, especially in people who have other comorbidities as we're seeing them in the outpatient space, that consistency of the dialogue is, is powerful and, and meaningful to them. Um, it's, it's interesting to uh, um, switch sides and, and actually be on the, on the patient side. I do not personally like being the patient at all, um, but uh, about three months ago, I had to have a foot surgery. And while I was in the surgeon's office for my pre-op, I, I noticed on the wall a, a framed, um, article that uh, referenced the lack of need for opioids for most surgical conditions. Um, it, it was really striking to me that, that they had these framed and on, on the office walls throughout the, uh, the clinic. Um, when I asked him um, how often people actually um, reference that, he, he said that it is an intentional part of their conversation with, with every patient that they see so that they could set that expectation before an elective surgery, continue that dialogue in the post-op period and then with those subsequent follow-ups. And, and one of the things that, that you referenced is the idea of, of tapering medicines and, and um, a plan to um, slowly um, go down on you know, whichever treatment, especially if there's an opioid that's involved so that you can maximize function without um, really having the, the danger or the side effect profile that, that you might see. Yeah, I think, you know, even in meeting patients right after a traumatic injury in the preoperative holding area, um, you know, I, I, my standard speech to them is that, look, we're going to use multiple different types of medications to manage your, plain, your pain, including opioids, but my hope is to try to minimize how many of them you use and try to get you off of them as quickly as possible. And most patients uh, are appreciative and, and understand where I'm coming from with that. Yeah, it's remarkable how many patients are scared to death of taking opioids at this point, and that. That seems to be a new conversation over the last couple of years as well because of all of the, um, the press coverage of opioid-related deaths and, 
and uh, addiction. People would prefer to, to take a more conservative approach, and especially if we can back that with data and reassure them that they're not going to be miserable. Um, one of the questions that, that many times um, comes up, and, and not just around um, opioids, but, but all prescription medicines, patients come into the office and they want to know, what do I do with this leftover medicine? I prefer not to have it in my house. I'm not sure if it's safe or dangerous. Uh, I prefer not to get confused and take the wrong medicine. So, so what can I do um, in that situation? You know, the first thing we talk to patients about it when we prescribe medicines is the safe storage and ensuring, especially with opioid medications, that they um, store them in a, in a lockbox or a secure location. I think we've all um, been the recipients of the phone calls where, where people have reported their medicines being stolen. Um, we, we also educate people on, on how to um, dispose of those medicines if they no longer need them. Um, there, there is um, a, a reference on the screen of opportunities to dispose of, of medicines safely. Um, the FDA does endorse flushing, but um, there are also other ways to, to avoid actually um, putting that into the, the sewage system. So. Um, those are important conversations to have with your patients because many of them aren't going to know that off the top of their head. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's all important information. And as far as you know, how we communicate with our patients as well, I think we have to be sure that uh, when we communicate with our patients, we we try to use multiple ways of doing it. And and we've um, you know studied this quite a bit in the orthopedic trauma population in that. Um, Patients already are in a stressful setting, and, and even when they're coming in in elective settings and in clinics, patients have trouble retaining a lot of what's told to them by physicians. So we've tried to double up our efforts with giving uh, written and pictorial um, information to patients as well, and then also being sure that it's at the appropriate uh, level as far as uh, uh, reading level. The average adult in the U.S. reads at about a sixth or seventh grade level. So we try to make sure that all of our materials are, are in a format that our patients can actually utilize them and understand. Um, the other thing that's, that's gone a long way and probably the biggest change in my practice as far as managing expectations and setting expectations, it, in particular when it comes to the medication part of this, is we used to just tell patients to take Tylenol or, or acetaminophen or take NSAIDs or ibuprofen um, as over-the-counter medications. But now, as part of our guidelines, we've actually started prescribing these medications, the acetaminophen and the NSAIDs, as written scripts. And um, it's really changed the mindset around them and that patients now understand and expect that these are part of their uh, pain control uh, regimen. And the most common refill uh, request I get now is not for their opioid taper, but is actually for their uh, prescription acetaminophen or prescription uh, NSAIDs. Yeah. It, it's powerful for something to actually be written down by the provider and ultimately um, dispensed at the pharmacy in, in the manner that you think of your, your treatment plan is going to, to come through. And, um, it's, I, I think it goes without saying, but we, we always have to make sure that we are having those conversations with patients to ensure that they're not taking other medicines in the same class. And, and people many times don't think of those um, over-the-counter medicines that they have in their cabinet as something that um, shouldn't be mixed or is essentially the same as, as some of the options that we're providing as well. So we always ensure that we incorporate that into the conversation as well. So with that, um, thank you. Um, this has been a great discussion. Let's summarize with our SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. Um, we hope that our listeners will take something from this that they can apply to their practice. Um, in the realm of patient education. Um, we know that it's essential to good outcomes and patient-centered care. Um, and hopefully some of these strategies will, will resonate with you and be something that you can incorporate into your practice. So 
Thank you, Dr. Mir. Thanks for having me. Yeah, have a great day.